Hello and welcome to the Fit Over 40 podcast with me, Rob Burkhead. Today's podcast is an interview with Trinity member Dr. Alessandra Diacutis, who's a senior chartered counselling psychologist and a certified coach, where we talk all about how to manage stress, anxiety and overwhelm more effectively as a busy working woman spinning lots of plates. Despite working full-time with demanding clientele such as lawyers, bankers and management consultants, alongside raising two daughters and a family, Alessandra has seen amazing success with Trinity, losing well over a stone and maintaining it now she knows how to work with her changing body and hormones in her mid-40s. And I'm confident that her knowledge and skill set as a psychologist helped her to see such great results. So in this episode, we talk about all the different tools and tactics that you can use to manage stress, anxiety, self-sabotage, perfectionism, and many more obstacles that often trip people up on their health and fitness journeys and in life in general. It's a fascinating episode. So without further ado, let's get into today's podcast. Okay, so Dr. Alessandra, first of all, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So before we get into kind of how to manage emotional triggers better, how to manage things like psychological changes around menopause, which I know you've got loads of really, really um, useful tactics and tips to help with. I want to rewind a little bit so people can find out a little bit more about you and what kind of defines you. So I'd like to rewind a little bit. So to, to your childhood and growing up, like tell us a bit more about your, your upbringing. Like where did you grow up and what were kind of those significant moments that led you to where you are today? So I was born in Rome and uh, in Italy. And uh, I grew up in a really normal family, I'd say. I, um, I have a sister and uh, mom and dad were around. And uh, it's, it was very, very lovely upbringing. Um, in Rome and uh, we always had uh, you know sunshine so that helps always <laughs> and uh, and we always had a um, really good time and uh, I think what really brought me to my job was when I started working and uh, I worked as a model and uh, that's when I developed an eating disorder I was mm-hmm. uh, probably around around 17 years old and uh, I was very conscious that that was something wrong but I didn't have the courage to to do anything about it so I um I just continued to be a model and to be compared to other girls and to other people in the in the industry and that led to the eating disorder so I I had bulimia for about six months and then I realized actually no this is this cannot go on and um I sought help without my parents knowing, since I was earning quite good money, I was able to um, to afford going to see a psychologist. And that is the moment that my life completely changed because I, I realized actually there was people who listened, people who normalized my feelings and people who were able to, to be there for me. And even though my parents would have totally been there for me, I was too uh, scared to worry them. So I didn't really... Um, didn't tell them until uh, about maybe three, four months into the therapy. And then I, I told them and they were really surprised. And they were like, no, you need to stop this job. And I was like, no, I don't want to stop the job. I just want to stop the bulimia, you know. So in the end, um, I was able to to recover quite quickly, actually, within about maybe a year, I was bulimia free. But this is when I realized, actually, there shouldn't be anyone experiencing what, what I experienced. Um, and there should never be any other woman who has this and is alone with it. So my mission was always since then, at 17, 18 years old, um, to be a psychologist and to be a psychologist for people with eating disorders. In fact, in the end, I didn't go into that because I got a bit sidetracked. Um, so I, <laughs> I then became an air hostess <laughs> because I, I wanted to travel. I thought, you know what, I'm going to be um you know 20 soon and I want to I want to travel a bit so I um all of a sudden I even though I wanted to study psychology I I uh, ran into an interview and my dad called me one day and he said he said oh you should go to this interview it's about being an air hostess and I was like oh I don't really want to go I mean I want to be a psychologist um 
he's like, well, but it's time for that. And uh, I got my, you know, I got myself convinced and I went to this interview and I worked for um, Virgin for about three years. And this is how I came to the UK. It was a complete uh, um, chance because uh, they needed someone here who spoke English and French um, and Italian, of course. And so I came and uh and I, after about three years, I got really bored. And I realized actually when I was, <laughs> when I was on, on the airplane, I still really enjoyed talking to people and I really wanted to, um, to listen to them. And what, it was the part of my job that I enjoyed the most. Um, and so that's when I started my training as a psychologist. And, um, and this is where I, uh, I really found my, my calling because uh, I, I initially wanted to to make a difference for people with eating disorders, and by that time I had I was eating disorders free, so my pull towards that wasn't um, as strong. So I went for a general psychology. So I uh, I started um, a psychology degree here in London, and um, and then completed that and went straight into doctorate in uh, counseling psychology. Uh, which is similar to, to clinical psychology at the time. Um, there was very few differences, and now there isn't either. So, so that's where I I began working uh, as a psychologist, and I and I, that was about 2006 when I qualified. So I've been working as a psychologist uh, for quite a long time, and uh, initially for the NHS, and then I I started private practice um, about maybe 2012, and uh, since then I've been working. Uh, both privately and with, for the NHS. And uh, in 2017, I stopped working for uh, the NHS and went completely private. And also trained as a coach in between. And I've been a coach for uh, organizations, training organizations to um, to better their mental health at work. And uh, this is where I am also that started uh, developing an interest for occupational psychology and well-being at work. So I realized uh, when I was working in a psychiatric ward for about five years that um, the people who needed the most help, of course, were the clients or the patients, but also the staff needed a lot of help. So I started developing programs for uh, staff well-being at work. And this is what led me to start my um, uh, master's in occupational and business psychology. And, um, and I can go into it if you want, unless you want me to to expand on that a bit more did you want i'd love you to, to talk about your experience juggling the masters alongside everything else in your life because i think for the people listening as i said before we started recording quite a lot of the people we work with are doing masters or are doing um additional educational training and find that balance really hard and i know for yourself you said even for yourself with all your psychological knowledge, there's only so many things you can do, right? It was a little bit challenging at times. So let's talk about that part of it as well. So how you kind of juggled the the work-life balance or whatever we want to call it, the kind of... Yeah. Well, over the years, I developed um, this approach called vision and values um, approach. So um, this approach helps helped me and helps helped all of my clients so far um, to choose. They cannot possibly be everything for everyone, and they cannot possibly be, you know, fulfill all the values all at once. Um, so this is how I chose what was important for me um, at the time. So, and in terms of vision, I visualized what I wanted at the end of uh, of the masters, and I also visualized how I wanted to be, what I wanted to be, um, and how I wanted to feel throughout the experience, um, so that. Every day when I woke up, I remembered about my values and my vision, and it motivated me to continue to to be the person I wanted to be um, by simply focusing on those uh, on these values and and vision. And uh, I trained um, businesses to um, on this on this approach, and a lot of people told me how much of a difference that made to themselves to their life because. You know, love values are a bit like continents. You know, if you look at the continents um, in the in the globe, you cannot really see the continents all at once. Even though you know they're there, you cannot see them all unless you can continue to spin around. And values are a bit like that. So you can only really work on one or two or maximum three values at once, because otherwise uh, you will get overwhelmed. And uh, and this is what 
what really helped me to get through um you know this uh, this process of the masters and but also life in general because uh, i have two daughters two dogs and a lovely husband uh, but it it is all like really time consuming you know working the dogs homeschooling the girls i did my masters during the, the lockdown so when i first started i didn't know there was going to be a lockdown it was 2019 and um for what i knew i was going into a face to face um you know, master program, part-time master program for two years. And little did I know that in 2020, it was going to be <laughs> locked down, homeschooling, all of that. So I was faced with that. And I, I realized how important the values were and the vision in, during that time. Because I had not done that, I would have got completely burnt out. Because my day looked like this. I woke up in the morning and then um, what, what, what was with my kids and homeschooling. And then about between six and eight o'clock, I would see my clients. And then in the evening, I would, I would study and then do it all over again the next day. So you can imagine how, you know, difficult that was. But I was driven, completely driven by my values, which were at the time, get this master done and uh, make a difference to people, you know, to, to widen this approach to, and have an impact on uh, a wider audience on what I found. So um, the, when I did my master's, I... Um, I proved that the well-being toolkit um, reduced stress and increased well-being just by uh, getting people to stop and think what was important to them. They realized that, you know, this is what I want to do every day and this is what I don't want to do every day and cannot possibly be everything. So if you think about, you know, list all your, uh, all, all your roles in your life, you're, you're, like a, you're a wife, you're a mother, you're a, uh, a worker of some sort, for me, I was a psychologist. I'm a coach. I'm a sister. I'm, a, you know, dog walker. So there's so many things that I want to do. I'm a piano player, uh, ex obviously a weightlifter, um, and uh, so there's some, so only so many things one person can do. But can you? Can I actually choose what is the most important one? So every day I want my day to be about this. And this is why I, um, I I focus on the most. So for me at the time, it was being a good mother, a good wife, and a good student. So that was the, the three values. I was, there was only so much I, I could do. And I ended up getting distinction for my master's. So I was really, really proud of myself. Obviously, I've been through a doctoral program before and you know, a degree. So I was kind of advantaged. But that was like 15 years before. So I was, you know, I was a bit rusty, I must say. Um, yeah. to kind of go back into that, into studying after 15 years of, yes, I had done my coaching uh, qualification, but, you know, the academic part of it was not exactly, you know, that fresh. So um, quite a challenge, I would say. Yeah, I can imagine that's quite nerve wracking. Even I'm just thinking now about, I did a master's in engineering, like that was a long time ago now. Can I, could I still do it? So you had a lot of things you're juggling and you pick these, was, is it three values that you went with as like oh, three hats you were going to be wearing, like three roles. Um, and is that what you usually recommend to people then like pick, pick three? Is there, is there like a limit to how many, cause obviously we can't do everything. What, what do you recommend in terms of number of roles people can succeed at at any one time? Yeah, I would say it really depends on their, on their stage of life and, uh, and on what is important to them. So, you know, if you think about your day at the end of the day, what would you, what would make that day a really worthwhile day? Um, a day that you are proud of, a day that you, where you feel that you really achieved something. So I would go by that. Uh, and, you know, I think it's, it's really difficult to choose because uh, obviously you're still going to carry on being a, a sister, a friend. A, you're still going to carry on doing all of those things. But your priority will be around those two or three. And I would say how many really depends on how time consuming they are. Because, for example, if you do like if you have like um, like a nine to five job, then you have from five to whatever whenever you go to sleep um, to do more. But if you have a, like a nine to you know eleven p.m. job, then there's a limit to what you can do. So it really depends on the on people's schedule, and obviously that can change as well. I and mean, part of my my role within organizations um, has been to to work with bankers and obviously they have bankers lawyers all the people who have high work in high stress um, environment and um, 
even though they had really stressful jobs and they had like um, 12, 14, 16 hours a day job, um, they still could choose within those times to have breaks and, and have a menu of breaks, for example, so that you pick what kind of things you want to do, you know, on a break. For example, like I have a client who has a, who loves guitar, loves cycling, and uh, also loves photography. So you'd have like uh, his uh, cycling shorts, you'd have his guitar, and then you'd have his, um, um, what was it? His, his camera, yeah, next to him. So whenever you had a 15 minute break, he could choose to, to use one of those things to go for like a 15, 20 minute cycle somewhere or pick up his guitar and do a song or, uh, you know, go out and take some photographs. So, or, or tidy up his photography albums, for example. So, you know, this is really possible still, if you have a really, really high pressure job to still choose to have those breaks and to, to have like a 10 minute, for example, when I, um, when I did my master's, I, um, I started playing piano. I don't know why I did that, but you know, when you say, uh, give, give something to do to a busy person, that's when they do it. Right. So I actually played more piano then than I do now. <laughs> it's kind of, it's interesting because I, I really, I remember I wanted to, to have those 10 minutes a day. And again, you know, this wasn't my value. So if it didn't get done, then it wasn't the end of the world, but I still, you know, managed to do it 10 minutes a day. And, um, and it didn't have to take long. It didn't matter what I did in those 10 minutes. It didn't matter how long, you know, how much of those notes I hit right. Um, you know, I, I did it and it was, it was really quite, you know, satisfying to know that I could play a song that I liked by the end of the year or two songs that I liked by the end of the year. Um, so I would say really that the, the number matters, but it, it also matters, you know, about what, what you actually uh, want to have at the end of the day that you've achieved what you what you want to visualize by the end of the day uh, you have achieved so you are not um choosing according to you know whatever societal pressures might be but you're choosing according to what you want and what your values are and what your um what your vision is or who you want to be every day how you want to wake up the next day what kind of intention you want to be having for the next day so um, that's how that's how what i would recommend yeah. And how have these shifted for you? So I know, obviously, you've had some great results with Trinity as well, um, in terms of weight loss, in terms of getting fitter, getting stronger. Like, did after the Masters, did you then kind of like reevaluate where you were and decide to set some new, like a new vision and new values? Like, how did that work? Yes. So, uh, like I said before, there was there was those three values, uh, but exercise wasn't in there. Even though I exercise every day, I exercise every single day during the lockdown. And it was always something that I did anyway. Uh, so it was not a new habit for me. Um, I've always exercised every day. Um, so that's that's not been, uh, uh, apart from Sunday, actually, because uh, Sunday is a day rest, of, day rest, day of rest. But, you know, this was um, something that uh, I did you know, anyway. But when, uh, when the Masters ended, um, I realized actually, even though I exercise every day, I still put on weight because all of the other things were not right. Like the sleep, um, the, mainly the sleep really, and the stress levels as well. Because even though I, I did it, I was still, I was still quite stressed really. If you, you know, heard my schedule, it was, I, I felt stressed just talking about it really, you know, um, but obviously I had no control over that. I had to get that done. Um, so after the masters, I, I said to myself, look, you know, these were the values that I focused on before. Now it's time to get my physique back to where it was before. And, and that, that was my value and it has been since really for the past couple of years. And since I, I joined Trinity, you know, it's literally skyrocketed to, um, to the main value really. Um, and I think I didn't know how much I, um, cared about what my body looked like and felt like until I joined Trinity because I thought oh, I need to do this but obviously it's not really the, the main thing and then I think joining Trinity has made me realize how much of a priority it was and it is and um, since January I lost like 
say seven or eight kilos almost. Um, and uh, yes, pr prioritizing my health has, has really made a difference. And also the type of exercise I did, I realized it was not right for my age. Um, and I didn't know that before. So I, I can, even though I exercise every day, it was mainly cardio, some strength, but not much. And obviously we know now from uh, you, you tell me that, uh, that cardio actually makes people own weight and, and you lose muscle as well. So having learned on that, I also uh, was able to focus on other aspects of my life, like the nutrition and stress levels. So, um, yeah, I think all of those things, um, came to the, as a priority then, you know, when I joined Trinity and after the masters. So that, that was really, I'm very grateful to you guys for that because uh, I wouldn't have, you know, put all those things together. I wouldn't have made uh, all of those changes to my diet as well in terms of like high protein levels if it weren't for your knowledge. And uh, yeah, I'm very and I think grateful. this position is in a brilliant position, a brilliant place to, to talk about what we're going to talk about next, which is kind of the, a lot of the challenges we see for members on the program or for people trying to lose weight in their forties and their fifties around menopause or alongside a really busy career or both, um, because you're, you know, you're a living, breathing, walking example of someone who's, who's done this. You're still working in a high pressure job. Um, you're still, you know, you've got yourself, your family, you've got your dogs and you saw these brilliant results and you put the work in, obviously you changed your approach a little bit, but there's a lot of challenges that come along the way, right? It's not always plain sailing. Maybe, um, for some people it's easier than others, but I think we're going to talk about a lot of the different ones with things like perfectionism, things like, you know, not, not having any tactics to deal with stress from work can lead to overeating or, um, negative thoughts can creep in. Like, you know, I've, I've messed up today. So you know, what's the point in continuing? So let's, let's jump into these. Cause I think you obviously will have used these tools, I'm sure throughout your journey for yourself. Um, but for people listening, then they can take these away and, and apply them if this is the challenge yeah. they have. So the first one I want to jump into is kind of like perfectionism. And I see this as either perfectionism or like an all or nothing mindset. I think a lot of the clients we work with have done very well in their careers. They may have done masters or PhDs like yourself, and they've, they've had this very high standard for themselves, but it, it's not necessarily helpful in terms of trying to be fitter and healthier. A lot of the time they have, but they make one choice they perceive as bad. And then, um, they, they think they're going to fail. Like they, they go, what's the point I've messed up. Um, I've eaten something bad. And then they spend, you know, one, two days, or maybe even a week or for some people, it can be weeks or months, then not trying, not looking after themselves because they think they've messed up. So how, how can people deal with perfe that perfectionism that is so common at the moment? Yes. So um, I don't know if you've ever heard of um, uh, the growth mindset. I'm sure you might have. So this fantastic psychologist, Carol Dweck, has an um, American psychologist, has designed, has written a book called Mindset. And she lists for, she li for the whole book, pretty much, she lists examples of people who have literally turned their lives around by just changing their mindset. And I would say that perfectionism is the, is the product of the opposite, which is a fixed mindset. So a fixed mindset is where you are thinking that you are just uh, in a certain way, like you're just a perfectionist, you're never going to change. Um, while a growth mindset is where you choose to think that you're getting better at something and you, you cannot be perfect, you know, at something straight away, you know, nothing comes without practice as we know with exercise and we know with, um, with lots of different examples. Um, so I would say the first thing is the mindset. So when you think about yourself as someone who is uh, learning something as opposed to someone who is just in a certain way and will never change, that in itself has, uh, you know, paves the ground uh, for your continued progress. And that continued progress can be seen through consistency. And consistency of what? I would say the first thing is about being aware of your thoughts. So one thing I didn't share about myself is that when I was about 20 years old, I ran into, I was dating a guy who um, did uh, meditation. And I still thank him for it today because he had introduced me to one of the most important aspects of my well-being, which is meditation. 
And why is it important? Because what happens is with meditation, so uh, you develop awareness. So what is meditation or mindfulness? They're the same thing, pretty much. One is the lay term, another one is the Buddhist, if you like, term. So in mindfulness, you are aware of your thoughts as they happen. So when you develop that awareness, then you are no longer at the mercy of your thoughts. And you are able to become aware of your thoughts so that you're able to catch yourself when you're being a perfectionist, to catch yourself when you're being negative about yourself. And then you're able to then make a different choice. So with mindfulness, you know, we know that has so many benefits um, to well-being uh, from immune function to, um, as we say, improved awareness, uh, but also choices that we make. You know, if we're more mindful, we're able to then see a choice in the moment. So you're never really um, in the next moment. You're in this moment. And uh, we know that if we think about the past, the past is gone, right? If we think about the future, the future hasn't happened yet. So all, all we really have is right now. So if we're able to be in right now, most of the time, then we're able to catch ourselves um, when we are thinking about things that in a way that isn't helpful to us for our long-term well-being and and say well stop and think one second you know how can i employ a different perspective on this on this matter um even i see it with my children i like you know when they do their homework um you know like, oh, i can't do this mom you know i just i can't be bothered you know i, I can't do maths it's not it's not me just can't do it I'm like well you cannot do that this yet because you're still learning it. You're still learning and you make mistakes and making mistakes is the bread and butter of learning and learning is a bread and butter of growth mindset where you're continuously learning about yourself. So in terms of the perfectionism, I would say the first thing is to become aware of your thoughts because the thoughts are connected to your feelings and your feelings are, correct, are connected to your actions. And if you think in a certain way, you're going to act in a certain way, and feel in a certain way. But if you change that from the uh, thought perspective, then you, you, you'll be able to make different choices and have different consequences entirely. So it's not a, you know, a process that will, will be done overnight. It's a process that will require a lot of consistency and a lot of um, self-compassion, I would say, because, you know, what, you know, if you think about yourself, like you think about a, a child, for example, you wouldn't just go and tell the child like, oh, you're rubbish at that. You wouldn't just go and do that, right? So why would you do that to yourself? Um, so why is that one rule for a child and a different rule for yourself? So I think maybe start treating yourself like you would treat maybe a small child, um, someone that you don't, you know, you would never speak uh, badly to or speak negatively to. And uh, so I think the consistency of it is what really will be... Um, creating good results, you know, in terms of like the consistency in a meditation and thinking of meditation as something that happens in those maybe 10 minutes, 20 minutes, five minutes, three minutes, you know, maybe starting that really slowly and building it up to, um, to an amount that you're happy with. And then thinking of the meditation as a starting point for the rest of the day or the, an intention for the rest of the day, the, the following day, if you're doing it in the evening, so that, you know, the meditation becomes or well, life becomes an extension of the meditation where you're observing what's going on and you are rea not reacting, but responding. So when you're reacting, you're like, like this, but when you're responding, you're thinking about it. You're not reacting, um, you know, impulsively. So I would say the consistency with, um, with becoming aware of your thoughts and also the consistency with meditation. And finally, not last but not least, um, it's really important to write down things. And why is that? I mean, it's not, it's not for everybody, but I would say that if it's not for you, you should really try it because it is, um, science proves that writing down has a more lasting effect, writing down thoughts and feelings has more of a lasting effect than if you talk about them. So why is that? Because you are creating, you are creating a emotional memory of what you're writing and of what happened. And so once you've done that, it's on paper, it's no longer in your mind. 
And secondly, if you employ that uh, alternative thought technique, so that thought challenging technique, um, then you'll be able to to counteract that thought and to challenge that thought in a way that will stay more, will stay longer with you. And of course, the same thought might happen over and over again, the same situation might replay, you know, over and over again. But then that warrants another thought, um, you know, diary, because you will you will then run into a different situation and each situation is slightly different. So, you, you know, you will then be able to learn something different from each situation about yourself and what you've done well. And when I go to bed every night, before I go to bed every night, I write what I've done well. Because um, then, you know, my day looks different. You know, if I then up until that point be a bit stressed, and then I think, well, actually, even though I've been a bit stressed, I have actually done A, B, and C, and D, and I realize how much I've done in a day. And I'm like, well, why did I think that I was stressed? I was maybe a bit stressed doing it, but I still did it. And I still, maybe I can th think about ways in which I can pace myself a bit more tomorrow. And then I write an intention about what I'm going to be like tomorrow that's different from today. And I think I love that. That's one of the you will know this obviously from phase two of our program one of the main focuses is it's all about mindset really but stacking the wins up because i think mo most of us immediately just go to problem solving and go what's wrong i think it's the general society and go oh that's wrong that wasn't good that that wasn't good and we we just start doing that and what we try and do with that win or with <clears throat> what you're talking about writing down your wins is i talk about stacking rocks on the other side of like a set of scales like lawyer scales because most of us are so leaning so far one way, I don't know if you find the same thing, that we end up believing we're way worse than we are and then we give up trying because we think we're failing. Uh, do you see that in, in clients as well? People just sort of end up procrastinating or stop doing something because they perceive themselves. Absolutely. We always have a, really you know, quite a, a lot of my clients do that and have a skewed ver version of themselves or a view of themselves. And actually, when if you if they were to ask somebody else about, you know, their view or tell somebody else about how they view themselves those people be horrified you know i mean like really you think that about yourself but actually when you look from the outside um you see a completely different view but when you're inside yourself you can end up with um, those negative thoughts building up over the years and becoming what we call in psychology core beliefs so that beliefs about yourself that become that probably are rooted around some childhood experiences um for example, for me, I can definitely see that, you know, the never enough was one of the things that messages that unfortunately my parents did give me. And um, and I didn't really, you know, think they were doing this consciously at all. And most of the time it's never intended that way. Um, sometimes it's, it is, but some, most of the time it's not intended that way. But I realized that the more I am, I gave into that voice, um, the more I would be self-sabotaging or not being my best, my own best friend. So I realized that I, you know, I had to really question those thoughts. And the first thing, you know, that they tell you when you start playing, you know, trained as a psychologist, um, especially in cognitive behavioral therapy, is that you are not your thoughts. And this is really, you know, was quite a breakthrough for me when I first, um, you know, heard about this. I was like, what? I am not my thoughts. Uh, of course, I'm my thoughts. I, I think my thoughts are so I am my thoughts. But actually, no, they they are transient um, facts or not facts, maybe transient events, I would say, transient events in your uh, in your mind that will come and will go. And we have up to 60,000 of those thoughts every single day. And they're pretty much the same day to day. I would say maybe from week to week, they might change. But we kind of try to, we we tend to preoccupy ourselves with quite similar things every day. So imagine the impact of you challenging every single thought that you had by yourself and about the situation you're about to deal with. Um, on a larger scale, if you are able to do this every day with every single thought that you have, and you, think, and you might think, well, I don't have time for that. That's fine because you have 60,000 thoughts, they're pretty much always the same ones. So you don't really need a lot of time. You need a little bit of time in the evening, maybe five minutes, 10 minutes to challenge the main thought, the one that bothered you the most. And then you can 
you know, maybe do the next one the following day. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. And the more you do this, you, the more written down, writing it down, the more you'll be able to do this in your mind. And it becomes like second nature. Um, and I, I realized that, you know, a lot of a lot of my clients don't know this and uh, they don't realize the power that they have inside of themselves to do this and the control that they could potentially have over their, you know, the way they think, act and feel um, if they apply this method over and over again. Because if you think about it, you know, the result of negative thoughts, well, the, the product of negative thoughts is the accumulation of those negative thoughts and experiences over the years. So if you sum all those experiences up, then the core belief, like I'm not enough, for example, will, will be produced. But if you, if you then, you know, sum up the good um, perspectives that you'd start building over the years, then you have more positive core belief will be built. I am enough as I am. I, I, am, I can try this again. Okay, this time it didn't work. I, I, will, uh, I will do better next time. So um, I didn't do this today. Okay, is it the end of the world? I can do, I'll put it in the next day to-do list. It's fine. Or maybe it wasn't to do with my values. So that's absolutely even more fine, you know? So I think it's, um, it's really a matter of continuing to be consistent with, uh, with that uh, thought-challenging technique. And I think it's also important to think about your physical sensations because sometimes, say you'll be in a conversation with someone and you get a physical sensation and you don't know what that is. But unless you then have recognized that in, a, in, a, in relation to your thoughts, then you will know what that physical sensation was about. So, for example, if I am anxious, I will get sweaty hands. I know that sweaty hands is anxiety. And I know that if, um, if I'm talking to someone and I'm getting sweaty hands, it means I'm, going, I'm being anxious. So I can do something about it. So the physical sensations are, are you know, the body is a real teller of, um, of how you feel. And, uh, and then if you connect those two, then you always be, even if you're in a conversation, you'll always be aware and in control because you will be able to, to do something about it as things happen. That makes sense. Yeah. Definitely. And I think from my understanding for a lot of our clients experiencing menopause symptoms as well, that some of those can be maybe random, but some of the vasomotor symptoms, so like hot flushes, night sweats, things like that, they can actually, especially hot flushes, they can be linked to um, your mental state. So anxiety, I think, is, a, is can be quite a strong trigger or, or things of overwhelm or stress. So it often seems to happen at the worst possible time for people because of that, like in a meeting where you're presenting and you're stressed, you, as you said, you probably already would get a response, but it's a much more, dramatic response because of the change in hormones. And is, is there anything people can do in the moment to kind of manage that? Definitely. I think that's, uh, you know, I think in the moment it's quite difficult, but it's still possible. But I also think you can do something before, but let's think of the moment first. So in the moment, I would say really focusing on your breathing. Like for example, at the moment I'm breathing deeply, but you're not seeing this, are you? So you can actually, you're not seeing this, but, you know, a lot of meetings are, are online anyway. So a lot of the times people don't have to see that you're breathing deeply, but I am right now breathing, breathing deeply. And uh, maybe you can take a pause as well. And really the breathing is the first thing that needs to be put into um, the right, the uh, needs to be slowed down. Because uh, before you got the hot, the hot flashes, you probably would have noticed other, you know, things, other symptoms or other uh, bodily sensations that maybe you you ignored because um, they weren't as you know I guess evident as an, a hot flush so um, as visible so I would say the first thing is the breathing so you can still talk and breathe and take a pause take a glass of water and really start uh, if you're in a conversation for example you're in a meeting. Uh, the first thing I would do is to ask a question about uh, to somebody else, so that you are not, you know, the focus is no longer on you. And if you like, if you are in the middle of the presentation, for example, and you're presenting and you're getting a hot flush, I would say, okay, let's take a pause now and think about what you've learned so far and what kind of things you you've taken so far from what I've said. Um, and you know, you can put this in the chat. I'll give you. Five. Now you've got you've got minutes, you've got time 
to then shift the focus from yourself onto the other person. And a lot of people who have hot flashes also maybe experience some anxiety symptoms and maybe some social anxiety symptoms or some maybe feeling of self-conscious about themselves. So the first thing is to really shift the focus from yourself to somebody else. So if the if you're at the beginning of that um, episode, then you start focusing on other people straight away as opposed to yourself. Because what the, the anxiety response that happens in the moment is everybody's looking at me. When actually that's not necessarily the case. I mean, if you're doing a presentation, yes, people are looking at you. But, you know, if you're able to then shift your focus to somebody else, then you're no longer worrying about your own thoughts in the moment. So you shift the focus to other, to somebody else and you start, you know, the, the conversation with other people and involving other people in the in the conversation. So you have a break and you can do your breathing in the, mid, in, the, in the middle of this. The other thing you can do before, so this is in the moment, before that, um, you can start a list of triggers. I think this can be quite unpleasant for some people, but... Um, it's, uh, it's really important to know your triggers because you know where you get prepared, otherwise you get caught out. So if you know that you know a presentation, for example, is your trigger, then you write it down and you think, okay, what am I going to do before the presentation to make sure that I'm not getting triggered in the moment? What exactly could happen in the presentation that will you know, trigger me? And then you write an ideal response to that trigger. So part of my well-being toolkit, which is the vision and values well-being toolkit, is the first thing I, I ask people is to first of all get their vision and values into perspective. So they're thinking about how they like to embody those vision and embody those values every day. And then after that, I ask them to create a list of triggers. Simply because then you are more in control. When you are when you know your triggers, you are more in control. Like for example, I know. That homework with my children is a trigger for me. Oh my God, it drives me insane every day. <laughs> so I know that that, you know, is going to trigger me. So I take some long deep breaths before the homework starts and I make myself a nice cup of tea and then I sit down and I'm like, okay, I'm doing this and I'm going to be the best mama and the most, best mother I can be in this moment. And I visualize myself being nurturing and encouraging and, um, not getting in, you know, I guess being patient and calm with my with my children. So similarly, if you write a list of triggers for your presentation, for example, you know that somebody asking you a question, for example, could be a trigger. And then you know in that moment you need to take a deep breath and really listen to that question and be 100% focused on that person and what they're saying as opposed to focused on you and what you are feeling. So... Um, the other thing I ask people to do is to think about an ideal response to each trigger. And that will help people to realize, well, actually, what, what would they like to do instead? You know, what would be the, the other ways they'd like to, to feel in that moment? So if, the, say, the hot flush happens in a moment where they are really embarrassed, you know, how what would they like to feel instead? Would they like to feel proud of themselves? And what kind of things are they proud of that they could, you know, think about in that moment uh, that would take them away from that hot flush, which at, the, at that moment is probably the only thing they can think of. So, um, so the ideal response helps uh, people to, uh, to, first of all, think about a way that it would like to respond to that trigger. And then it helps them to think about what kind of person they want to be in that moment what kind of uh, value they want to embody in that moment, what kind of person, um, personal qualities they want to you know, show in that moment. So that it's, um, it's not about what they don't want, it's about what they want. So, um, and finally, I get people to think about the resources. What resources do they have already? Because, you know, when you said about the winds, um, you know, people have qualities and resources they don't even know they have. You know, I, re I remember when you know, when you work with your workouts, you always say, when you think you can't do something, uh, you can't do it anymore. You've always got 40% more. You said that, right? In one of your workouts. So, and it's the same with psychological resources. You know, what are they? What are the resources? Like podcasts like this could be a resource. That people listen to when they need that um, psychological SOS. Uh, it could be a meditation session. There are plenty 
meditation um, in podcasts where people have an SOS after, for example, they got angry um, or an SOS um, after they got really anxious. So this could be another resource. It could be that, you know, their own ability to contain themselves it could be the breathing, like you could do like the box breathing. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of the box breathing? Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's lots yeah, of different yeah. ways, aren't there? There's like four seconds in, yeah. four second hold, four second out. Yeah. Four second hold, repeat. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And you go around the box. So in, out, in, out, four times, um, three or four times. And now you could do the, the hand breathing. So you go up a breath and then down a breath up and um so and you go in and out and then all of those breaths so as you track practice. your for the people listening because not everyone's going to see you're tracking your fingers and you're breathing in as you go up slowly a finger and then down is that right as you go down exactly you the whole hand yes i've not heard of that one that's cool yes i do this with my children because it's quite visual so they can mm. you know the box can be quite uh, difficult to imagine while the fingers are right there in front of you and accessible to most people so um, uh yeah it can be quite uh quite useful to have that so um yeah so i was uh yes so the the resources so if we go back to the resources it could be a friend it could be calling a friend it could be a resource it could be um you know writing journaling could be a resource um there's so many that people could list um it could be just stopping and and not doing anything for five minutes, <laughs> you know, stop and think, what is my, what is my choice right now? What is my need? A lot of people forget about their needs because there are so many other people's other things to do. And then that like basic needs are not met. Maybe they go through like 11 hour day and they, they haven't eaten or like, you know, things like that can be really easily done. Um, so maybe to just stop and think could be a really good resource. Stop and think, what is my need? Simple question. What is my need? Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a really important. So the well-being toolkit really lists all of those things. Um, first, the vision and values, then the triggers and ideal responses. Obviously, the positive self-talk goes in there as well, um, like we, we discussed earlier. And then your resources, the things that... And I would say that the final thing I would say is, you know, what are the early signs? Because, for example, you're in that presentation or you're in that meeting and the hot flush is you know, started. But, you know, chances are that there, there, there would have been other things that happened before that maybe signaled that hot flush. And quite uh, similarly, there could be other things that signal anxiety or low mood. There could be many, many things that could signal that before it happens. So to become aware of that, and this is why meditation is so important, to become aware of what are the early warning signs that a hot flush is about to come. So you can actually then maybe excuse yourself, go to the toilet or something like that if you're like in a meeting, you're not presenting maybe, or, you know, so maybe there are some early warning signs if you educate your body or if you listen and observe your body to, to see what those early warning signs are, then you'll be able to... I guess, learn more about your body and your mind and how they connect and how they uh, they work so that the more educated you are about your own body, the more choice, better choices you can make in the future. So you're never really at the mercy of the next um, hot flush, if that makes sense. Totally. Um, and yeah. you mentioned your wellbeing toolkit. Um, so this is a combination of the, is this right, the vision, the values, the triggers and the resources. Uh, these kind of things, which sound really exciting to me. Maybe I'm a nerd, but <laughs> this, you know, I, I know everything stems from the mindset. If you want to lose weight, if you want to thrive in your career or as a parent, as you know, as well, like I, I personally believe it all starts with the mind and, and those visions, the values, all of those things are part of that. So where can people go um, if they want to get that? Can they get that for free, that wellbeing toolkit? Or is that like a paid resource? How does that work? So they can come to me for a coaching session and uh, or psychology session uh, or both. So I do something called coaching psychology, which is a mixture of both, or they do coaching or psychology, psychological therapy. So it's, at the moment, uh, it's, um, it's my thesis. So it's my master thesis. So it's not been yet, um, you know, it's published, but it's not yet a resource that is accessible online. 
So I currently teach that resource um, and in businesses, and uh, I do well-being interventions mainly in businesses and um, and individually. So they can come to me direct for that. It's not something they can uh, obviously now I've talked about it, so they can just jot down things, but um, and uh, and they can do it themselves. Um, but if they want a more in-depth um, version of it, you know, whereby you're guided um, to to discover all of those things about yourself, mainly coaching sessions with myself or uh, business uh, interventions, well-being interventions, um, it's the only way at the moment where I'm, where you can access it. I'm thinking of uh, or developing an app, but it's still like uh, in the pipeline. And you know, I'm also thinking of converting what I've um, I've written in my thesis into a book. So, but that's still things that obviously with life you have to choose your values, and this is not the current value of mine right now. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the reason why it's not happened yet. But that's the way to access me and my um, well-being, vision and values, well-being toolkit at the moment. Amazing, and I'll put some links in the show notes so. If anyone's listening to the podcast, they can access those. So to your website to find out um, where they can access those things. And what would be, so you said there's, is a, you know, you've got the wellbeing, um, the toolkit for businesses. What kind of business, you know, tends to come to you or what, what do you think it's most helpful for? Because a lot of the people we work with own their own business or are in a leadership role in business. What kind of scenarios, you know, would that, would that really attract or work for? Yeah, um, it's quite a flexible tool, so it can be applied to any sort of business, really. I've started uh, testing it, first of all, on uh, bankers and lawyers uh, simply and management consultancies, simply because at the time when I started thinking of developing the toolkit, it was the, the client group that uh, was most accessible to me at the time. And I'm talking about maybe 11, 12 years ago when I started uh, testing the toolkit. So I've tested it for 12, you know, 10 years, I'd say. And then uh, the actual study happened in um, in uh, 2021. Uh, and it was the, the people I used, the participants I used for the study came from a range of backgrounds. So they came, uh, one was a like pharm- pharmacological uh, company, a small business. Um, another one was a, a bank. Uh, another one was a school, um, so a teaching staff in the school, and um, and then there was a, another business which which was a um, management consultancy. So there was quite a lot of a uh, different range of uh, of businesses, and uh, and school as well. You know, I haven't I haven't tried the you know, GP surgeries, but I had a, a couple of uh, psychologists um, in the program themselves as participants. Who said that this could be some the next step? I guess to to roll it out to GP surgeries for for doctors and uh, nurses. Because obviously we know with COVID, uh, we know even before COVID that uh, health professionals are the absolute worst at looking after themselves. And so, yeah, yeah. So um, so that's how that's what the kind of business is. Quite as I said, a very flexible tool. Small businesses. Sure, you know, I I actually also rolled it out to my husband's business as a as a you know property services business, so it's uh, it's you know any business really needs a well being toolkit because when people are well they are more productive when people are happy and their values are being embodied in their everyday life at work, then you know what more can you ask from your employees? So you know we know increased productivity, increased well being, and reduced stress will make uh, a worker any worker more productive. So and happier so that's uh that was proven by my study and um and yeah so that there was no real like specific business so what who i work with right now is mainly bankers and lawyers um and management consultancies but you know as i said i tested this on schools and um pharma- pharmacological companies and it, it still worked really well so um the data shows that showed exactly a very similar you know uh, results across the board, different business. So, which makes me think that actually it doesn't matter which business. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like something that's I'm happy about. <laughs> yeah, it sounds very versatile and something that everyone can benefit from, right? Like you said, right down to the individual, we need to have everyone 
feel good in ourselves i think you need that direction and you need the the, the resources and all these things to to manage like life is stressful nowadays <laughs> For anyone, let alone the like the clients we work with, as you know, who are typically able to juggling like children, maybe looking after aging parents and changes around menopause and a career. There's so many different things. And I think having that grounding helps them, I imagine, would help them get off the treadmill, which so many people we work with are on, where they're just kind of running on adrenaline, just trying to get through the day. There's no real purpose or direction anymore. It's just like need to survive every single day. Um, yes. So I will send them your way. I'm aware of uh, conscious of the time because there's so much we can talk about. I find this fascinating. So I'll have to have you back on our Sandra uh, another time. Thank you. But I just want to say thank you so much uh, for what you shared today. It's been really, really fascinating. Thank you as well for having me. It's been so lovely to share what I've uh, what I've done so far and a bit of my about my life and and also to give back to Trinity for what you guys have done for me and. Uh, and I am uh, very grateful as well for all of that and for you amazing coaches. Um, so thank you.